Hello! It's good to see you this morning. Welcome to Faversham Baptist Church's online worship for Sunday the 15th of November. And I'm out and about again, as you can see. I'm here this morning at the cemetery at Love Lane. We're picking up that theme that we were looking at last week as Paul broached the tricky subject of death and what happens to those who have died. This week, he picks up on the idea of Jesus's return and we shall be looking at that together a bit later on. Also, we'll be hearing some of the voices of the persecuted church and praying for them. But of course, we start as always in worship and prayer together as God's people here on the Lord's Day. Let's worship him. We gather here at the end of one week and the beginning of another. O Lord of decades and days, centuries and seconds, we stop now for this moment and turn together to you who holds all time in your hand. Make us ready to receive you as we gather in this way here and now today. We ask it in the name of Jesus. Amen. We're going to sing together. The song is The Light of the World and it tells how God came to earth in the form of Jesus to live and die for us. Please sing along. You're able to do that whilst we're at home on our own. And at the end of the song, there's a little reel, a little Irish jig. So feel free to dance. Kate will be playing away. You dance and if dancing's not your thing then maybe you'll be able to reflect and give thanks to God for his mercy and love which are given to us in boundless measure. Let's sing. The light of the world may history begin Spoke time into being caused planets to spin Flood galaxies wide through his splendor and fathomless grace. The light of the world that shone as a man, and walked through the valleys he carved with his hands. A servant to those he breathed into life, he felt our injustice and shed in our strife.
Lord, you have been our dwelling place throughout all generations. Before the mountains were born or you brought forth the whole world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. You turn people back to dust, saying, return to dust, you mortals. A thousand years in your sight are like a day that has just gone by or like a watch in the night. Yet you sweep people away in the sleep of death. They are like the new grass of the morning. In the morning it springs up new, but by evening it is dry and withered. We are consumed by your anger and terrified by your indignation. You have set our iniquities before you, our secret sins in the light of your presence. All our days pass away under your wrath. We finish our years with a moan. Our days may come to seventy years, or, or eighty if our strength endures, yet the best of them are but trouble and sorrow, for they quickly pass and we fly away. If only we knew the power of your anger, your wrath is as great as the fear that is your due. Teach us to number our days, that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Relent, Lord. How long will it be? Have compassion on your servants. Satisfy us in the morning with your unfailing love, that we may sing for joy and be glad all our days. Make us glad for as many days as you have afflicted us, for as many years as we have seen trouble. May your deeds be shown to your servants, your splendour to their children. May the favour of the Lord our God rest on us. Establish the work of our hands for us. Yes, establish the work of our hands. Bye.
can I do but thank you? What can I do but give my life to you? Hallelujah, hallelujah. What can I do but praise you? do but thank you what can we do but praise you we thank you that as we draw near to you you draw near to us that as we listen for you you listen to us thank you that you gather our hearts together and nurture us by your words of eternal life that you draw us in that your love and your wisdom are like the bright sun in the morning, the soft moon of the night, like the dawn and the dusk, the kind opening and gentle closing of the day. We praise you for your love and wisdom, for the strength and consolation of your hope, for perseverance and courage and joy 
for the journey and love for all time. We thank you for your everlasting love. Our hearts are full of worship. How can we keep from singing? For you are enough, you are all we need, and we worship you. My life flows on in endless song Above earth's lamentation I catch the sweet though far off hymn That hails a new creation No storm can shake my inmost calm While to that rock I'm clinging since Christ is Lord of heaven and earth, how can I keep from singing? Through all the tumult and the strife, I hear that music ringing. It finds an echo in my soul. How can I keep from singing? No storm can shake my inmost calm While to that rock I'm clinging Since Christ is Lord of heaven and earth How can I keep from singing? What though my joys and comforts die, the Lord my Saviour liveth. What though the darkness gather round, songs in the night he giveth. No storm can shake my inmost calm, while to that rock I'm clinging. Since Christ is Lord of heaven and earth, how can I keep from singing? makes fresh my heart a fountain ever springing all things are mine since I am his how can I keep from singing no storm can shake my inmost calm while to that rock I'm clinging since Christ is Lord of heaven and earth, how can I keep from singing? No storm can shake my inmost calm, while to that rock I'm clinging. Since Christ is Lord of heaven and earth, how can I keep from singing? Well, this year we've got used to worshipping in this kind of way. It's not something that any of us would ever have expected. We've learned how to do this remotely using YouTube and sometimes Zoom church. Let's see how some others have been getting on, shall we, with their Zoom church. Welcome, everyone. Is Pete here? Uh, Jenny? Uh, she did say she was coming. Well, um, well, let's get started and, and hopefully they'll join us. It's just so good to gather and enjoy fellowship. How's everyone doing? Yeah. 
doing okay, but we do miss you all. It's hard not being able to gather together. Um, <coughs> Jane, I think you're down to do our first reading. Yes, today's reading is from Matthew 20, starting ting ting Oh, um, Jane seems to be having some technical problems. Well, while we wait, do, does anyone have anything they'd like to share? I've been thinking it'd be great if we could pray for people who've lost their jobs or people who've been threatened with losing their jobs unless they agree to stop meeting. And what I would really like to pray for protection um, and for the leaders as well. Uh, thank you. Yeah, I'm sure Pete and Jenny will appreciate your prayers too. During our prayer time last week, we had some trouble with the neighbours. Oh, sorry, Chris. Chris, we lost you for a minute there. Oh, sorry, can you hear me now? Yeah, that's good. Last week, we had some trouble. Um, there were people banging on the doors and the windows. Did the police come? Yeah. Sam was pretty scared when he saw them at the door. Jesse's too young to understand, thankfully. Are they finding it difficult? Yeah, it's been tough on them. Sam's been told he can't go back to school. He's really missing his friends, but we're proud of him, you know, for taking a stand. Perhaps we could pray for those who don't know where their loved ones are and those who've lost their loved ones. Yeah. Uh, so, has anyone heard from Matthew? He disappeared on his way home on Monday. He vanished. It's Jenny. She says Pete's been taken. What? We got the text as well. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that in your word, you say that you will never leave nor forsake us. We pray, we pray now, now for Pete. Hey, who are you? No. We pray you that when our faith spin. is tested, we would stand strong. Go, go. 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 Oh, no, please. Stop. Stop. Where's my wife? What have you done with my wife? Uh, Graham? Graham? What just happened? Can, can someone tell me what happened? Hello? Graham? Who's going to lead us now? Quite powerful, isn't it? You know, we really shouldn't complain about the conditions we are worshipping under right now when so many of our brothers and sisters around the world are putting up with so much more. We're going to spend a few moments thinking about that and then praying together for the persecuted church. Next time you go to church or pray with others in your home, remember that most people around the world don't enjoy that same freedom. So they say, just collect your belongs. We must put her far from the city so she can't pray, she can't do anything. She was California more. One is Kula, Kumashila, Kemi, one is Kula, Kayel Moko, while Stani Mokea. Before then, the church has been burnt several times, and there was no time there was a riot in the state, or I mean, there was any religious violence that the church was not touched. Yo estaba hablando de que hay un reino que no soporta el gobierno ni la dictadura. They have two options, you know, or kill me or put me in jail. Freedom of religion or belief is an issue that affects so many in so many different ways. Some Christian children have to change their names into Muslim names in order to get to school. 
or in some cases, they have to leave their homes, leave their parents, and go to other states and stay with other families in order to get to school. I come from school, where's your dad? Well, he is in jail right now. Que había una orientación desde el gobierno de que a mí se me tratara de la peor manera que se puede tratar a un ser humano. Eh, había toda clase de tortura física y mental en contra mía. When he beat you with this stick, you feel the whole your body fire. They know where is the nerves. For over 40 years, CSW has been a powerful voice for freedom of religion or belief at the UN, with the UK and US governments, the European Union, we speak to those with power to bring about change. We've seen captives set free, and we've seen policy change that has affected thousands, if not millions of people's lives around the world. As Christians, we stand with everyone facing injustice because of their religion or belief. We've been advocating on behalf of the displaced Rohingya Muslims in Burma since 2005. And that's way before most of the world had even heard of their plight. Why do we do that? We do it because that's what Jesus would do. I believe that it is our responsibility as an organization to speak out for all religious groups, not just Christians. Còn khi mình làm việc cho những người không chưa cùng với mình ạ thì để cho họ thấy được rằng là mình là người mình là người tin Chúa thì họ thấy được cái đức tin của mình và qua công việc của mình họ sẽ biết đến đến Chúa của mình. We believe that advocacy and prayer are a powerful combination. Porque aun cuando yo no estaba orando eh, con toda la intensidad que que necesitaba por la condición en que yo me encontraba. And in the morning I I was released. Es que fue la oración la que me salvó la vida và nhờ sự cầu nguyện của anh chị em và Chúa đã hành động cứu tôi ra khỏi Việt Nam. Join us in building a movement for religious freedom. And together we can change many more lives. The videos we've seen today are from Christian Solidarity Worldwide, just one of the organisations that work with the persecuted church. You're probably aware of some of the others, Open Doors, Release International, the Barnabas Fund. Some of them have got together under the auspices of the Evangelical Alliance and have organised the International Day of Prayer for the persecuted church, which is in fact today. You may well see something about that if you're on social media later on. We're going to pray together right now for the persecuted church. And Father God, if we're being honest, some of us don't know very much about Christians in other countries, the millions upon millions who are persecuted for their faith. We lift in prayer all those whose governments have created laws that make it easy for the state to oppress, abuse and kill people who belong to religious minorities. We bring to you those who are taxed or fined by government for following their faith. We pray for those who are the victims of terrorism around the world, for the millions who have fled their homes because their religion puts them under threat. We grieve the places on the globe where our faith was born that are now practically empty of Christian presence. We lift up all those without homes, traumatized, grief-stricken in the wake of violence and oppression. We lament that there are so many communities that have been fearful, slow or unwilling to show hospitality to those who are refugees. Lord, we pray that you would comfort and show yourself present with those who are suffering for their faith. We pray for boldness in living out the Christian faith in places where that is not welcome. And we pray for those who persecute our brothers and sisters. May their spirits be touched by the incredible faith of those who they attack. And may they open their hearts to your love, we pray, in the name of our Lord Jesus. Amen.
We're reading today from 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, where Paul picks up on some of the things that he's already addressed in his letter. Last week, we were looking at the subject of death, and Paul had spoken about Jesus' promise to return to earth. Paul was so excited about Jesus coming back that the Thessalonian Christians became absolutely convinced it would happen during their lifetime. And so they were disappointed, confused and upset when some of their church members died. This was a real tragedy. They were going to miss the coming of the Lord. But Paul says, far from missing it, they were going to get front row seats. The first Christians understood the second coming as the day of the Lord, a a spiritual carryover from their Jewish roots. In the Old Testament, the day of the Lord was understood to be a cataclysmic event on the horizon, a day when God would intervene in the course of human history and the promised Messiah would come and reign over all creation until the close of the age. That's what we hear in the Hallelujah Chorus. The The kingdom kingdom of this world is become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ. And he shall reign forever and ever, King of kings and Lord of lords. Hallelujah! The problem was, it hadn't happened. The early Christians waited and they watched and they more or less kept the faith. But Jesus didn't appear in the clouds as they'd expected. In the meantime, they continue to live under Roman occupation. And what's worse, they were being persecuted by the Jews. And with the faithful beginning to die off, this created a crisis of faith. Was he coming or not? Well, here we are 2000 years later, and we're still wandering. Like the early Christians, we live between the no longer and the not yet. Jesus no longer walks on this earth as he once did, but then he has not yet returned in glory. So what are we to do? That's the question. And it's often answered in one of two ways. On the one hand, there are those faithful Christians whose primary mission it is to keep the message alive, not to lose the spirit or the enthusiasm or the hope that Jesus will return at any moment. And as far as they're concerned, that's what we live for, his imminent return. You've probably seen some of those signs, Jesus is coming, look busy. I once saw a sign saying Jesus is coming. It was a concrete sign. Something wrong there, isn't there? A bit of a double message. If Jesus is really going to appear at any moment, shouldn't it be made of cardboard or paper? Maybe even held on a stick by some faithful prophet. Reinforced concrete? For many Christians, this is the primary message of the gospel. Jesus is coming. It is only a matter of time. Prepare to meet the Lord. The problem with that is, it's so hard to keep the excitement going. At the same time, there are equally faithful Christians who believe that the second coming is, in a sense, it's already happened. They they would point to Pentecost and the coming of the Holy Spirit. For them, Jesus' promise to come again has already been fulfilled, only in a different way to what they expected. For them, God is with us here and now, and if God is with us, well, what more could you ask? For these Christians, what's important is that we work together for peace and justice in the world today. As far as they're concerned, God has already given us all we need to establish his kingdom on earth. Now it's up to us to do it. The promise is we'll experience the presence of the living Christ along the way. This is what Albert Schweitzer said in his book, The Quest of the Historical Jesus. He comes to us as one unknown, without a name, as of old, by the lakeside. He came to those who knew him not. He speaks to us the same word, follow me, and sets us to the tasks which he has to fulfil for our time. He commands, and to those who obey him, whether they be wise or simple, he will reveal himself in the toils, the conflicts, the sufferings which they shall pass through in his fellowship. And as an ineffable mystery, they shall learn in their own experience who he is. So let's see. We've got this one group of Christians who say Jesus is coming and another who say he's already here. So what do we say? Our faith can be summarised in three short phrases. Christ has died. Christ is risen. 
Christ will come again. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. That's to say, we believe in the historical Jesus who lived among us and showed us how to live in community with God, with each other, and who died for the forgiveness of our sins. We believe that Jesus was raised from the dead and is with us even now in the form of the Holy Spirit to lead us and inspire us in our mission to reconcile the world to God. And we believe that Christ will come again at the close of the age to reign in glory over all of God's creation. We express this faith every time we celebrate communion. We say, every time you eat this bread, and drink this cup, you proclaim the saving death of our Lord Jesus Christ until he comes again. And so this is the essence of our faith. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. In the light of that, what are we to do? How are we to live? Paul gives us three things. Look up, Wake up, buckle up. Look up, wake up, buckle up. Look up, wake up, buckle up, he says. Now, brothers and sisters, about times and dates we do not need to write to you, for you know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying peace and safety, destruction will come on them suddenly as labour pains on a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. Jesus told his disciples he was coming back. No one knows the day and hour. He said not even the angels of heaven know, but only his Father. We don't know when, but we do know it will happen. And we are getting closer and closer to Jesus' return. Paul says, that people who have no time for God will be caught by surprise. But those of us who follow Jesus should not be taken by surprise. We have to see past the immediate and look up, look up to all that God is doing, recognising that salvation and peace and safety comes from him, not the government of the day or the military or anywhere else. God's eternal plans and purposes are ultimately what we look up to, knowing we're in a mess, and only he can save us from it. Whether the end comes sooner or later than we might expect, there's one thing we need to be clear about, and that is that the day of the Lord is, in the proper sense of the word, quite an awful prospect, full of awe. To the Jew, all time was divided into two ages. There was this present age, which was holy and incurably bad. And then there was the age to come, a golden age of God. In between those two things would be the day of the Lord, which would be a terrible day, a day when one world was shattered and another was born. The prophet Amos put it this way, woe to you who desire the day of Yahweh. It is darkness and not light, as if a man fled from a lion and a bear met him. Or he went into the house and leaned his hand on the wall and a snake bit him. Won't the day of Yahweh be darkness and not light? Even very dark and no brightness in it. John Newton was asked something along the lines of what would surprise him most when he got to heaven. And he said there were three things. Firstly, he would be surprised to see some people that he hadn't expected to see there. Secondly, he would be surprised that some of the people he expected to see there weren't there. And third, he would be absolutely amazed that he was there. It is the height of arrogance and self-righteousness to think that when the Lord appears, you're going to be one of the good guys, that you're going to be in the in-group. <laughs> the coming of the Lord Jesus exposes the sinfulness of our human nature. It reveals our many shortcomings. Amos envisioned the Lord in the midst of his people as a plumb line, a perfectly vertical line exposing the crookedness of human nature. But this day, terrible though it is, will be a wonderful day. Remember last week we said, Jesus is coming with a shout of command. What will he say? I think he might say enough. He might shout enough, 
when he returns. Enough suffering, enough starvation, enough terror, enough death and indignity, enough of lives trapped in hopelessness through sickness and disease. Enough, enough, enough. When Jesus returns, he may well shout, enough. The tears and the tragedy, the chaos and the calamity, the horror and the heartache, disease and death itself will be over forever. Yes, it's the noisiest verse in scripture, enough to raise the dead and boy, it will. The day of judgment is a good thing, but also a truly terrible thing. And we should shudder a little at the thought but wrongs will be righted, justice will be served. I will stand before my God knowing my failure, my sinfulness, my falling short. But I will be loved and forgiven and accepted through Jesus, ready to be accountable to him for all that he's invested in me. So look up and also wake up. Wake up! But you, brothers and sisters, are not in darkness, so that this day should surprise you like a thief. You are all children of the light and children of the day. We do not belong to the night or to the darkness. So then, let us not be like others who are asleep, but let us be awake and sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk, get drunk at night. Jesus is coming back like a thief in the night. He himself said it. But we're not to be taken by surprise. Only those who are asleep will be taken by surprise. Now, this is the second use of the word asleep, used here in this chapter in a totally different way to the chapter we looked at last week. There, it was people who have died in Christ who were said to be asleep. Now it's those who are living without Jesus, outside of Jesus Christ. They're the ones who are really asleep and it's the most dangerous sleep of all. This sleep gives the illusion that the world is here forever, that only material things can truly satisfy us, that I am free to do exactly what I want, when I want, regardless of the consequences. That's why the Bible says, wake up wants to give us a good shake. For those of us who are awaiting the day of the Lord, Paul appeals to us to be awake and sober and not to fall asleep as others do. The gradual erosion of faith by life and its distractions was as much a danger for Paul as it is for us today. We should be a people of self-control, sound judgment, alertness, discretion, dependability, studied decisions. You see, the truth is nobody knows when the day of the Lord will come. It could come today. It might not come for a thousand years. In a sense, it doesn't matter. What matters is that we live each day in preparation for the moment in which we'll be called to account for how we've spent our time, used our resources and kept the faith. This is what life is all about living each day as if it were a day of reckoning, so that when Jesus comes, you'll be able to account for yourself. And in the final analysis, Jesus will look at your record of faithfulness and say, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Look up, says Paul. Wake up and buckle up. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, putting on faith and love as a breastplate and the hope of salvation as a helmet. For God did not appoint us to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. We are to look up and wake up, not so as to avoid being caught out one day in the future, but so as to live truthfully and daringly now. Life and faith can be a battle. And Paul talks about buckling up, putting on the armour that God has given us, faith and love as a breastplate and the hope of salvation as a helmet. He's talking there about a Roman centurion. He could equally have spoken of a suit of armour or maybe in modern language, a bulletproof vest and one of those military helmets you get that protect 
the head, that kind of military headgear. That's our faith and our hope and our love. It will protect us as we work out our salvation. Buckle up, says Paul. There's work to be done. Do you remember this from earlier this year? What are you doing? Looking, Looking up. up. Why? Don't, Don't know. know. Expecting, Expecting something, something, I suppose. suppose. Ask, Ask them. them. What are you doing? Looking up. Why? Don't know. Expecting something, I suppose. Uh, ask them. What are you doing? Looking up. Look, why? I don't know. I'm expecting something, I suppose. Ask him. What are you doing? Looking up. Why? Waiting for Jesus. <laughs> Didn't he give you anything else to do? Oh yes, but he'll be back soon. Uh, how long have you been waiting? Oh, about 2,000 years. 2,000 years? <laughs> Give or take two, that's a lot of waiting. Well, what else did he ask you to do? <sighs> His Bible. Huh? Just one or two things one then, or eh? two. <laughs> Hadn't you better get started? <laughs> oh, yes. Oh, yes. 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 <laughs> Soon. Where are you going? Hey, you... You don't want to miss Jesus. Well, maybe I'll bump into him in some of the things he's told you to do. But we need hey. that book. What? You know... Wait a minute, all this about... Yes, we need that book. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. We're not to be lazy while we're waiting for Jesus Christ to return. There is work to do. Just as a person puts on a uniform when they go to work, we put on the armour that God has given us, which we use while we're living out a Christian life. Faith and love act as a breastplate that protects the heart. The hope of salvation is a helmet that guards the mind. Faith is the certain knowledge of God, his promises and his salvation. Love is a yielding to God in joyful obedience. And hope, which looks to the future, is an assurance of salvation, which goes hand in hand with the obedience. Paul means that believers must live in a state of spiritual readiness, ready to meet spiritual challenges, ready to resist the tempter, ready to defend the faith. Look up, he says, look up, wake up, wake up and buckle up. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. We stand in the middle of it all. We're in the thick of it. Paul looks back at what has gone before in the story of redemption. Last week, do you remember? We believe, he said, that Jesus died and rose again. And then he looks forward to what is to come. We believe that God will bring with Jesus those who've fallen asleep in him. We're in the thick of it. We're in the middle of it all. One day Jesus will be personally present as Lord of the nations, King and Judge in a transformed and recreated heaven and earth the culmination of God's purposes for his people and his world. Meanwhile, although God himself will bring about the new creation, we do all we can to be signposts, pointing to the restoration that Jesus began on the cross and will one day complete. Which is why we look up and see what God is doing. We wake up to the reality of our situation and that of the world around us and we buckle up to face all that God has for us in Jesus. So, will you step up? Will you step up? He died for us 
so that whether we are awake or asleep, we may live together with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up, just as in fact you are doing. The next great world event isn't an Olympic Games or a, an outbreak of world war. It's the return of Jesus Christ to the earth. The fundamental hope of the Christian, Jesus is coming back. There are over 300 references in the New Testament to this, similar to the number of references to the death of Jesus, to the cross. And we stand poised between the cross and Jesus's return. Faith looks back to the cross, hope looks forward to Jesus's coming, and we live in love right in the middle. The Bible tells us that when Jesus finally returns, all wrongs will be made right. The unrighteous will be judged. Those who have trusted in Christ will enter into the immediate presence of God in the new heavens and new earth. God promises that there will be no more sin, no more tears, no more death, no more pain. And when he appears, we shall be like him because we shall see him as he is, says John. With those kinds of promises, you'd expect that we'd be thinking about the return of Jesus a lot more than we actually do. But we don't. We get caught up in the details of life, weighed down by the effects of sin, distracted by the empty promises of the world. We think more about the stock market than the second coming. We anticipate a new season of The Crown or I'm a Celebrity, Get Me Out of Here, much more than the return of Jesus. We act as though Jesus coming back is far enough away that it shouldn't seriously affect our lives now. And we're so much the poorer for it. In 2 Timothy 4 verse 8, Paul says that Christians are those who have loved his appearing. He tells Titus that we are waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Saviour, Jesus Christ. And Peter says that we should be setting our hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So, are you ready to step up? as a believer in Jesus Christ. Believers should encourage and build up one another in the faith. Paul said that before, hasn't he? Encourage one another, build one another up. That's why we worship together. That's why we pray together. Will you step up and play your part? We can be certain that Jesus's return is closer today than it was yesterday. Tomorrow, it will be even closer. Jesus is coming again. Will you be ready? for his return? Or will he catch you unprepared? Are you looking up, waking up, buckling up and stepping up? How about this? Each time you open the curtains during Advent, remember the temple curtain torn in two and the clouds torn apart at Jesus's baptism and pray, oh Lord, that you would tear the heavens open and come down. Remember that in Jesus, God has come down to work with you and in you for the world's redemption. And if you're ready, if you're looking up, fully awake, buckling up as a servant of the coming King, then step up right now. Encourage one another. Encourage one another. Right now, right here. Let's do it. Let's encourage one another. Let's do it. Let's do it now. Last week, the message was pretty much the same in chapter four. Encourage one another. So I'm going to ask you to do the same thing again. Just prayerfully ask the Lord for three people, maybe uh, one or two from your kaleidoscope group, maybe someone else in the church, who you can encourage, who you can contact. Write them down right now so that you won't forget to do that. And this week, contact those three people, encourage them, say that you're praying for them, ask them if there's anything that you can pray for. Let's step up right now and encourage one another and build one another up as Christian people. This is not for someone else, this is for you. Let's all do this and I'd be delighted to hear from people who've been contacted and encouraged by someone else, just so that we know that it's happening out there. And while you're thinking about who you can contact, let's sing, Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come.
come again. Let's rejoice. We believe in our suffering Saviour. Jesus Christ hung upon the cross. Sinless man, ruler of creation. In his death we see mercy's cost. As we trust in our suffering Saviour, our hope remains. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. We rejoice in our living Saviour. Third day he rose from death. As the Spirit of Christ lives in us, we are raised in his righteousness. We give praise to our living Saviour. Lift high his name. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. We have hope in our coming. Saviour, in the day when in Christ we'll rise, made anew with the whole creation, sharing his everlasting life, as we wait for our coming Saviour, we, we will, will proclaim, Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. So that's it for this morning. Thank you for joining us. It's been great to have you with us. I hope very much that as we spend a bit of time together, you have encountered the Lord Jesus for yourself. We'll be here next week. So until then, goodbye.